there is some confusion about baptism. When, when I first got saved, there was some confusion. When I went on the doors and I met people door to door, I would meet some who believed that you part of your salvation was getting baptized. And I had to go and, and go to my Bible. I had to ask questions. I had to learn a lot about it. And it's been years since I ever thought that anybody would be, unless you're a Catholic, because a Catholic believes that baptism is part of your salvation as well. But I just thought nobody would really believe that, and yet they do. So we're coming into the Gospel of Mark, and uh, we're studying it verse by verse. It's the shortest gospel, but it is certainly power-packed with truth about who Jesus is and what he does. For the past few weeks, let's read Mark chapter 1. I'm going to read down to verse 8, and then we'll look at the baptism just uh, a little bit more. Mark chapter 1 and verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I mean, what a statement. Just right off the bat, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Who was the messenger, by the way? Talk to me. It's John, John the Baptist. Verse 3 describes and it says, He's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And he cried, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Verse 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And it went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, just stop there for a second. If you really believe that baptism is part of the remission of your sins, that should have stopped it right there if there's no need for Jesus. Amen? No, not at all. He's not permitting anybody's sin. Verse 5, And John was clothed with camel's hair, and with a girdle of a, of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. He would have a feast over there in India. Have you seen all those, those locusts that have been devouring up thousands of miles? Verse 7, And he preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed ba have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with something else. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So the last few weeks, we've met John the Baptist. We've been trying to clear up some of the confusion about baptism because you can get confused. How many of you think that the Bible is just easy to read? You get it the first time you read it. How many believe that? No, the Bible is written by God, and without spiritualized, without being born again, it is gobbledygook. Even after you're saved, take your Bible, go over to... Um, 1 Peter um, chapter 3, is it, or uh, let me look here. Is it 1 Peter or 2 Peter? It's 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Nope, it's going to be 1 Peter. <clears throat> I'm looking for the verse where it says about Paul. It must be 2 Peter. I'm not... Sixteen, good. Okay, Second Peter chapter three. Sorry about that; just came right to my mind. Verse fourteen, Second Peter three fourteen. Wherefore, beloved, seeing we ye look for such things, look for the second coming of Christ. Be diligent that you may be found of Him in peace, without spot and blameless. That's how we should live. An account, add up, learn that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Amen. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So Paul's written to the same people. Peter's now writing to. Verse 16 says something really unique. He says, as also in all Paul's epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things, what? What are the next four words say? Which are hard to be understood. So if Peter found them hard to understand, you can believe we're going to find some things hard to be understood. And here's the other part, which they that are unlearned, and unstable, they never can decide, this is right, or that's the truth, or whatever. They that are unstable, they rest, they twist, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. So we go back here, and uh, we're trying to clear up some of the confusion about baptism, and here's the points. Number one, John only baptized with water. Now that may be simple to you, but that brings up to the next point, Jesus never baptized with water. His disciples baptized Water, but Jesus was going to baptize with something else. Jesus, what did Mark chapter say? Mark chapter 1 say Jesus was going to baptize with? 
the Holy Ghost. Now, Matthew actually says there were two things Jesus was going to baptize. Uh, Jesus only baptizes using two other things. One of them is the Holy Ghost. That's salvation. And with fire, that's damnation. So Jesus never baptized with water because he wanted to separate his type of baptism from John's. John's was only water. Jesus was eternal, spiritual. It was either you're, you got the Holy Spirit and you're saved, or you're going into fire, and that's the judgment of God, damnation. So John's baptism was only for the Jews. No Gentile got baptized with John's baptism. Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit occurs at salvation. John's baptism has now been replaced by believer's baptism after, his res after Christ's resurrection. Anybody that had been baptized by John, when Paul met him, he said, well, who are you baptized unto? And they said, well, to John. And they said, have you heard of the Holy Spirit? And he said, no. And then Paul preached them Jesus, and they got baptized in Jesus' name a second time because believer's baptism supersedes John's baptism. Now, anybody remember what the gospel is? Somebody define the gospel. Very simple. Hold on, raise your hand. Tell me. It is good news. Excellent. But it is the good news about Jesus, and what did he do? What are the three things that he did to save us? He died, he was buried, and he rose again. And it's done. When Jesus said it is finished, did he mean it? He meant it. So when we look at the gospel, I showed you, and I'm not going to go through it, I gave you five undeniable truths about the gospel, and it's all about Jesus. It's not about baptism. It's not about any of what we could do. So let's talk about um, uh, this thing. Our salvation is based only on what Jesus did and not anything else that we can do. Let me, let me show you that. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. You can leave Mark for a little while. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. In verse 8 and 9, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through what? Okay, so who has the grace? God. Who has the faith? Or supposed to? We. So I'm saved because God offers it, that's His grace, but I receive it by faith. Look at the verse, it keeps going on. And that not of yourselves. Salvation is not of yourselves. Salvation is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Go to Galatians 3. You're in Ephesians. Go back to the left. <clears throat> Galatians 3 and verse 2. This, would I, this only would I learn of you. Paul is right into the Galatians who had been affected by cult leaders who had tried to turn them back to religion and back to good works to get saved. And Paul said this, This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit of God by the works of the law or by the hearing of what? All right, so how do I get the Spirit? By faith. That's it. You don't do the works of the law to earn, merit, receive anything from God. You, you just believe, and God gives you His Spirit. Go to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. Galatians 5, 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ, Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, sometimes you can apply that to sin. But you might want to take a guess what this bondage was. The law, expectations, doing good. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised and proud of it and saying, I just got circumcised, everybody, what does the next five words say? Christ shall profit you nothing. Wow, if you count that your circumcision is part of your salvation, then Christ has done you no good at all. Look at verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that now he is a debtor to do the whole law. This is very important. Follow me. If you believe that you have to do anything to get saved, and this is how all cults operate and all false religions operate, they believe 
that you do just a small thing, like get baptized. They will then say for the rest of your life, but that's not enough. You have to do everything. You'll have to keep the whole law. And that's the point. I never had to get, keep the law to get saved, and hallelujah, I don't keep the law to stay saved. You say, that sounds really cheap. That sounds like you're going to abuse it. Of course I'm going to abuse salvation. Just like any child that is adopted into a family, that child is not made perfect, but that child is in. So, uh, keep going. Verse 4, Christ is become, if you are circumcised, then Christ has become of no effect unto you. He had no effect on you. Whosoever you that are justified by the law, ye are now fallen from grace. What a way to talk. So, uh, religious good works and expectations are a yoke of bondage. Circumcision was a good work, yes or no? Circumcision was a good work. Baptism, good or bad work? It's a good work. You say, how can baptism be a work? Because you have to do it. Now, faith, Paul makes it very clear. Faith is not a work. Faith is just a belief. I don't have to go anywhere. I can be nailed to a cross next to Jesus and believe and be forgiven. Amen? Faith is not a work. Only Jesus did all the saving works. And if you try to do either circumcision or baptism, you are now entangled in the yoke of those things instead of being free in Christ. Now, Jesus alone, secondly, so salvation not received by any work could do. Jesus alone suffered for sins in the place of all sinful people. Let's go to 1 Peter 2. Let's use Peter. 1 Peter 2, in verse 24. Speaking of Jesus, 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self, hmm, he alone bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we now, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. What's the best part of that verse? By his stripes we've been healed. If his stripes heal me, why do I have to do anything? except just to receive the gift of God. Go to 1 Peter 3.18. I had somebody tell me, you must obey in baptism to receive that gift. And I go, what a strange thing. If I have to obey a call to do a work, then I'm trying to help Jesus save me. And they can't do that. He already did it all. I hope you agree. Look at 1 Peter 3.18. 1 Peter 3.18, your Bible says, For Christ also hath, what's that next word? Once suffered for, and it's plural. You ought to circle the last S on that word, for sins. What can you believe that means? All sins. He's once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, for us, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Hebrews 9. Go back to the left, find Hebrews chapter 9 in verse 26. Hebrews 9, 26. If he didn't die once and finish the job, verse 26 says, For then must he often have suffered since the very foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Did Jesus put away sin, yes or no? Yes. Well, if he did, and he's given this thing as a gift, he said, if you, he said to the woman at the well, he didn't say, woman, I want you to run around the block. I want you to, to clean my shoes, and uh, I want you to mend my shirt. He said, if you knew who it was that is sitting next to you, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. Remember him saying that in John chapter 4? He didn't ask her to get baptized, didn't ask her. He just said, just ask, and you would get the living water. It was funny. She said, well, great, wherever this living water is, give it to me. She didn't know he was talking about eternal life yet. Uh, Hebrews 10. According to Hebrews 10, we're, uh, next, next chapter there, we're going to see that we are sanctified, cleansed, purified by the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. Hebrews 10 verse 4 says this. 
But in those sacrifices of the Old Testament, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. You never, you never quite are free from it because you always have to remember your sins and confess them. Sounds very Catholic, doesn't it? Verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. All right, so who did God prepare a body for? Jesus. You don't want lambs and goats and bulls and turtle doves and things. You prepared a body. Verse 6. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, thou hast had no pleasure, because they didn't, they didn't do the job. Verse 7. Then said I, this is Jesus, lo, I come in the volume of the book of Psalms, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Now, above, when he said, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings, and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law, then said he, he's repeating himself, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He, Jesus, taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. You might want to take a guess. What did Jesus take away and replace it with? Well, kind of the law of Moses, but the expectations of the law. It's called the covenant. Under the covenant, you had to get circumcised. Under the covenant, you had to keep the law. But all of that under the first covenant, he took it away, nailed it to the cross, and he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. And he established the New Testament. Keep going. Um, verse 10 is the key verse. By the which will, by his decision, we are sanctified. We are not hope to be, but we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So can a person, as you read the Bible, can somebody say, because I'm baptized? I know it's, it, it, most, most people who believe in baptism also believe it's the blood, also believe it is obedience. But let me tell you, does baptism fit in any of this, or is it by Christ that we are sanctified once for all? Only the blood of Christ. So, this is all leading somewhere because the point is, in other words, you cannot have remission of sins by anything other than believing the blood of Christ is enough. That's why I said, if John is preaching, be baptized for the remission of sins, and if it did remit sins, then why did Jesus need to come? It didn't remit sins. It prepared it so they could receive the remission of sins, which is only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, this was a question that uh, uh, Marcus asked. We're going to go to one of the top five confusing verses in Scripture. All right, First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three, and the question is: Was Noah saved by water? Because here you're going to have the word baptism and saved by water all together, and we're going to have to go. What is he talking about? Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, your Bible says this, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Okay, we, we found that out, haven't we? The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Anybody want to tell me what are the two things that are in that verse? There are two parts to it. What are they? Death and quicken. What's quicken mean? resurrected, made alive. So just remember that, verse 19. Be by which he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited way back in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, watch this, eight souls were saved by water. Hmm. Verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Boy, if you wanted a perfect verse to back up the idea that baptism can save you, that's the one. But keep reading. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has ascended and gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto Him. So let's look at these verses. Number one, verse 18 says the Messiah, we've already established through looking at several scriptures, he's the one that suffered for sins. 
while he was physically dead, did you notice it says that he went and he preached to people in hell? Did you notice that? It said, verse 19, after his death, it says, by which, by the Spirit, he also went and he preached unto the spirits in prison. You say, well, maybe he was preaching to the saved in, in paradise. Well, no, because those in prison were, look there in verse 20, they were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, these were the ones that at, time, at the time that God was patient with the world. How long did God wait while the ark was preparing for people to get right? How long was it? It was 100 years. God actually said, I'm going to give the world 120 years, and Noah got the boat built in 100. <laughs> and then it says, wait in the ark, and he mentions the ark, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. So he's preaching to souls that have been judged by Noah's flood. Now this is very important. And um, uh, let's find my thing. <clears throat> Um, ba, 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 ba. Now, why did Jesus preach to him? What do you think he said to him? I have no idea. I don't know. I'm gonna, one of the, it, we got all eternity to talk to Jesus. One of the questions I'm going to ask him is, says, why did you go and preach to the prisoners in hell during those three days and three nights? And maybe he'll answer me. Maybe he'll laugh and go, it's not important. I don't know. <laughs> but that is, that is something I cannot answer. Here's the issue. What about those eight souls in the ark? All I know is this. All right, well, let's go. They were, it claims that they were saved by water. So let's now look at that. Verse 20, it says this. These, these souls, these spirits in prison, were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. They were wicked if you go back and read Genesis chapter 6. God said, I'm going to give them 100 years to repent, and they didn't while the ark was preparing. And so we end up, out of all of those souls of the people in the world at that day, only eight souls were saved by water. So it's a strange phrase. You have to admit that. Um, and uh, uh, this, this idea of being, were they saved by water? Or what did, it, what did the verse also mention? or something that was going to actually be on top of the water. The ark. Thank you. So were they saved by water, or possibly could they be saved by an ark that endured the judgment of the water? Take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 6. We'll come back to 1 Peter in a moment. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 17. 617 says this, it says, And behold, I, God speaking, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to what? To destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life. Now, not all animals died. Fish didn't die. But every land-dwelling animal, human, every bird, from under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. Go to chapter 7 and verse 7. And Noah went in. Where did he go? Into the ark. And his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood that were coming. Look at verse 17. Go down to verse 17. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bear up the ark, lifted up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth, and the waters prevailed, and they were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains by that water was covered, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man. Isn't that a sad phrase at the end? And all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was on dry, that was in, dry, in the dry land died. Let me just say this. All I know is the whole world 
Every soul that was alive was judged by water. That water was not a sign of salvation. Would you agree? That water was God's judgment on the world. And if anybody was saved, not one of those people who were wet got saved. Who got saved? The ones in the ark. So how? All I know is the eight souls, that's Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives, were saved by being in the ark, not by getting wet. So somebody says, well, the Bible says. I know what the Bible says. There are some things that are confusing. Be careful. Yes? Okay, but if they weren't in the boat, they're going to die. I understand, but did the water save them? I know, I know you're trying to help out, but think about it. Did the water save them? No. The ark saved them. Nope. No, by and from are two opposites. Those two prepositions are not the same. It's not possible. Well, saved from the water would be, I would agree, but we didn't write the Bible, okay? So uh, there are a lot of things I would try to, if I started down that road, I'd try to correct in my Bible, and I just went, no, God knows what He's doing. It would, that now... He now is giving you a clue why there are plenty of Christians who constantly change the Bible, trying to help out God. And I just stick with the old King James because I'd rather me adjust than keep trying to adjust the Bible. Yes, but from, from there's, a whole, there's a whole Greek procedure that you learn which preposition it is. Is it in, on, of, from, to, out. There's all these prepositions. And uh, by is the right word here. It's absolute. I'm sorry. Not really. But anyway. So the question is this. How were those eight saved by water like Peter seems to say? Well, verse 21 tells us. Back there in first, Peter. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Three words. The like, say it with me, figure. So, say by water is a figure of speech. It's not a doctrine. It is an explanation of what baptism pictures, not what baptism does. The like figure, wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. And then notice Peter, after he wrote that, he felt compelled to make sure there was a parenthesis, a bracket there, and he explained. What did he explain? That is not the washing away of sin. So, when we look at saved by water, it is not talking about cleansing water. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Um, let's keep going. But it goes on there, and it says, not the, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God. The answer. Funny. All right, so if I asked um, Dean, Dean, are you there? I didn't say, are you all there? He said, are you there? <laughs> So Dean's maybe somewhere, and I say, Dean, are you there? And guess what he does? He answers back. Now, that is not a work. It's just an answer, amen, yes. So baptism is not you working to get saved. It's you just answering back to God, saying, I'm following you now. All right, now watch. This will get a little bit more interesting. By the way, let me make a principle. Too many people will snooker a Christian because they'll show a verse that seems to say something. There are plenty of verses that seem to say you've got to keep all the commandments. You ever seen those verses? There are scriptures. Jesus says, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. And the Seventh-day Adventists will always run you back to the whole list of all the commandments. And they go, no, no, no. Those are, it's Jesus' commandments. He says, keep my commandments, which are different than the Old Testament law. And so here's the point. Just because something looks like it says such and such, doesn't mean you just accept whatever you first think. Test it. In Acts chapter 17, Paul goes into a, a synagogue, and there are some, some Jews. They're not even saved. And those Jews were called Bereans. 
And listen to what the Bible says. These Bereans were no more noble. They were more noble than those over in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind while Paul was preaching. And it says, and they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So even though Paul was saying it, they says, wait, wait, I want to make sure I understand it. I want to make sure I get it. You're in, in uh, go to 2 Peter real quick, chapter 1 and verse 20. 2 Peter 1, 20. Knowing this, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. The point is, just because you get something, does, and you, you say, well, that's what I think it says. Well, good, that may be what you think it says, but that doesn't mean that that's what it says. You need understand, test, find out. Maybe there's more to it than you see. That's normal learning. So let's get back to this thing. Um, the Campbellites believe this. People who believe that baptism is part of your salvation. This is from their own documents. They believe baptism in water is one of God's conditions of the pardon from sin. They believe that baptism is essential for salvation. If you ever pick up a, a, a track by a Campbellite, it's a guy who sort of made it popular. People who, they call themselves disciples of Christ and they call themselves church of Christ and things like this. They say that baptism is essential for salvation. This is what they say. In baptism, the blood of Christ remits our sin, not before. You may believe, you may cry out and ask Christ to save you, but the blood is not applied till you get into the water. They believe that water plays a vital part in your salvation. And they claim that water is how salvation is received by the believer. And that baptism is how God imparts grace to us, just like Catholicism. If you know anything about the seven sacraments of Catholicism, each one, including baptism, is how you access grace. Nobody accesses grace through anything. For by grace you are saved through faith. End of story. So, we go back to this thing. Baptism shows a new believer's good conscience toward God, to the world, and especially to other Christians. Now, baptism is a three-step process. What are the three steps? Number one, get into the water. Number two, get under the water. Number three, come up out of the water. Every time you find somebody baptized, they're never being sprinkled. Nobody's pouring water on them. That's what's happening, okay? And um, it is simply symbolizing salvation in a ceremony. You're just going through a ceremony that symbolizes not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but your good conscience now towards God that, you know what, I'm living for you. Let me show you this way. In John's baptism, these are the facts. Number one, Jews were placed into water they only repented. That's all they could do. They only got wet. No one was born again, and no one got saved yet by John's baptism. Can we agree? If they did get saved by John's baptism, there was no need for the Messiah to come. Would you agree? Second, everyone that John was baptizing and getting to repent, every one of them still had to look for and then fully believe on the Messiah to save them when he came. In Noah's baptism, now we're coming to 1 Peter. The flood water destroyed life. I've always been challenged. I said, you're going to bring that guy back up out of the water, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's not a judgment, not in, not in believer's baptism. But Noah's baptism, the flood water destroyed life. It is a picture of dying under the wrath of God. The water of Noah's flood saved no one. It killed them all. Does that make sense? It was the ark that protected the eight souls from the wrath of rising water. So the water was the wrath of God, and that ark, guess what took the brunt of the wrath of God? The ark. That's a picture of Christ. Everybody else was slaughtered, but those in the ark were saved. So when the water finally subsided a year later, and those eight people on the ark came out and started over again, guess what it looked like? Life again. They had gone through death and resurrection. Now, believers' baptism 
It pictures the judgment and death of the old me by Jesus in my place on the cross. When he died, he died in whose place? Ours. So baptism pictures me dying on the cross through Christ's substitution for me. I should have died, but he died. Believer's baptism is the hiding of me in the ark. Believer's baptism is showing that I am now in Christ. I don't get put in Christ by physical baptism. The thief on the cross was in Christ. And if you are in terminally ill in some hospital somewhere, you or if somebody that you're witnessing to, and they get saved, but they can't get baptized, they're in Christ. You're in Christ. You don't have to be baptized to be put in Christ. You're put in Christ by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, um, baptism of the Holy Ghost. Jesus puts you. For by one Spirit are all, we, we are all baptized into the Messiah. The ark pictures Christ, the Messiah, saving us from that judgment, and coming up out of the water is seen like a resurrection to a new life. It's that straightforward. Now, here's some thoughts, and I'll ask for questions. Number one, believer's baptism, therefore, is not John's baptism. If anybody comes along and says, Mark chapter 1 says, you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. No. Nope. Because that's John's baptism. I don't get baptized by John's baptism. That's not what a believer does. John's baptism was for the Jews. Secondly, believer's baptism is a figure, a ceremony that doesn't cleanse anybody. It is just a, a symbol of our salvation by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, it is a public answer of a good conscience before God of faith in the living, resurrected Savior and not of our works. Somebody, some people say, well, I'm not sure I need to get baptized. I'm not sure I can get baptized. I'm afraid to get baptized. I understand. It may take a little while. It'd be really nice if you got baptized. And everybody should get baptized. My goodness. But baptism doesn't put you in Christ. You're still going to heaven, but you're definitely not going to ever start obeying God unless you do the first thing, which is be baptized. It's a public answer of, I follow Jesus. Fourth. It's a good work. Like we said, baptism is a good work, but it's a good work of a believer, not of a sinner. You don't do a good work to get saved. Now, go to John chapter 1. Two more thoughts. Gospel of John chapter 1. Do not mix baptism with receiving Christ. This is what you'll hear. You'll hear somebody say, well, when you're being baptized, you're receiving remission of sins, you're receiving Christ. Well, you sure? John chapter 1 in verse 10. He, Jesus, was in the world. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Nobody knew that that was God in the flesh. Verse 11. He came unto his own, his own people, and his own received him not. But as many as, what's the next word? Just received him. To them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that just believe on His name. Do not mix your baptism with believing on His name. I'll show you next week that every time somebody believed, it was then they got baptized. They didn't believe as they got baptized. You say, what's the big difference? Well, that would make baptism part of your salvation. It was always, you believe, and then you get baptized. Now, how many of you were baptized as a baby? Let me see your hands. Didn't do you any good, did it? Baptism doesn't change anything. Belief in Jesus Christ, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ changes a life. You then get baptized. You don't mix baptism with receiving Christ. That's what comes. Somebody says, well, why do you wait? Why do you let people go so long without getting baptized? Because I want to make sure they don't think that their baptism is saving them because there's a lot of confusion. Last thought, beware of other Gospels, because there are people who preach other Gospels. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians eleven three. 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. What does beguiled mean? 
deceived, tricked, snookered. Just as the serpent tricked Eve through his subtlety, he didn't just come out and say, I'm going to damn you. No, he was subtle. So your minds, I fear that your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Aren't you glad all you need is Christ? All you keep your eyes on is Christ. You look at your life for very long. If anybody looks at your life, they're going to see flaws. They're going to see mess-ups. They're going to see failure. But our simplicity is in Christ. Look at verse 4. It goes on. For if he, that cult leader, that fancy speaker, that YouTuber, if he that cometh preaches, notice the three things, another Jesus. Answer me. Are there other Jesuses? No. But somebody will come up with an, an idea of a better Jesus. Jesus 2.0, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive, next thing, another spirit. So if somebody comes along and starts promoting another spirit, which we have not, ye have not received, you already received it, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted. My fear is that you might well bear with him. You might actually like what he's saying and follow him. Go to Galatians 1, and we'll finish this. To the right, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6. So, let's establish. Does everybody believe that there's only one Jesus? The Jesus of the Bible. No, no, no. I'm talking about, not, I'm talking about everybody. No, no, no. Okay. So, you're going to run into people who say, well, my Jesus wouldn't send anybody to hell. Well, my Jesus is just a good teacher. See, there are a lot of Jesuses that are promoted. And unfortunately, Christians get duped into thinking, yeah, I like that Jesus better than the one I find in my Bible. There are other spirits, and there are Christians who get into churches, and then they, I came away, and I tell you, the Spirit came upon me, and wow, I just had the power. And I, Be careful, be careful, because sometimes, many times, that's not the spirit of Christ. That's the spirit of the Antichrist, and you're deceived. And people preach other gospels. Look at chapter 1 and verse 6 in Galatians, and we'll finish. I marvel, Paul writing to the Galatian Christians, he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed. You've walked away from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. The him is their preacher, the person who had been given them the gospel. He says, you left your church. And you've gone to another gospel. You walked away from the grace of Christ unto another gospel, verse 7, which is not another. It's not possible to have a second gospel. There's only one. But there be some that trouble you, upset you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But Paul gets very emphatic, and he says, but though we, he even puts himself, if I ever change and I start teaching a different gospel than what I've been preaching, though, <clears throat> though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you already, let him be, what's the word? What does accursed mean? Hmm? Doomed? How about damned? It's a serious word. You wouldn't, wow, you just don't curse you. I mean, let that person who preaches another gospel be a curse. Verse 9, I, as, I said, as, said, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man, he repeats himself, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have already received, let him be accursed. Beware of other gospels that just seem like, well, okay, I, I don't understand. You know, it says repent and be baptized. Believe and be baptized. So I guess I got to be baptized to be saved. Be careful. Because up until this point, you've been trusting Christ. You didn't trust the church. You didn't trust yourself. Now you're going away from Him that called you under the grace of Christ. All right. I rushed through these things because I want to finish, and I don't want to delay. So I hope I'm not too fast, but let me see. Are there any questions? I want to give you a moment to ask if there's anything. Yes, ma'am. Correct. He was, uh, he was the first Gentile. He not only was, he not only was, um, let me take a step back. And, and, and Peter and the Jews had now moved into 
this age that we're in where tongues marked the coming of the Spirit of God. Jesus said, not many days hence, you will receive the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, okay? And that came on the day of Pentecost, and He has never left. He came. So, um, and it came to the Jews. And the Jews thought they were the only ones that were ever going to get saved. So here's, and they were now rebaptizing all these Jews who are now following Jesus. On the day of Pentecost, as Peter preached, it says, they that received his word, who believed Peter preaching, they believed and they were baptized. So the Jews are getting saved and rebaptized. But now we got a Gentile. And the Jews are like, well, he's not a Jew. And Peter says, he just spoke in tongues just like we did. He's in the body. Let's baptize him as well. Because that's what you do. Baptism is not part of salvation, but it's what you do after you get saved. If you read on in Acts chapter 2, where it says uh, they received his word, they were baptized, and then they joined the church. It's kind of funny. Well, if baptism is part of my salvation, I guess joining the church is part of my salvation too. No, it's not. It's just what you do. Okay? It's just the next thing. Case in point, um, somebody, um, Patrick here, falls in love with Mrs. Wright. Just pray her first name's not always. He falls in love with Mrs. Wright, and, and he gets the courage to go up to her and says, I love you. She's going to say, where's the ring? <laughs> because words are cheap. And she's like, the next thing is, let's get engaged. Let's make this thing work. Amen? So when we get saved, we then get baptized. So Peter was saying, he's one of us now. Not to make him one of us, but to tell everybody we accept him. Okay? Another question. Very excellent question. Yes, sir. Correct. Right. Okay. Um, it's part of discipleship because you are just like when is the Lord's Supper necessary for your salvation? No, but the Lord's Supper is a reminder of what it took to save you. Baptism is a one off. Public testimony of, I understand, this is what you're saying, I understand that Christ died and was buried and rose again to save me. And you're making it public. Now, it's part of your discipleship where you are acknowledging, I understand this now. What is this importance? It reveals that you understand how you got saved, not that you think you are being saved, okay? So, the truth is, I said it last week or the week before, when you were here, I said, water baptism means nothing to your salvation. Absolutely nothing. But it does mean something to your spiritual growth. It is a good work for a Christian to do. Are Christians commanded to love one another? If I don't love one another, will that affect my spiritual growth? Yes. And if I'm told in the Bible, wow, everybody got saved, they all got baptized, when do I get baptized? That's, that's the first step of Christian growth. But it's not what made you a Christian. See, this is where rightly dividing the word of Scripture, where I say, this is the gospel, this is salvation, and this is baptism. I'll say what I've said for the past several weeks. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. Christ sent me not to what? Baptize. Who did God send to baptize? John the Baptist. Paul says, I'm different. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to do what? To preach the gospel. So there's a difference. Excellent. The Great Commission is, notice all three parts of the Great Commission. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, as you're teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Um, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Now here's the question. If you think that baptism is what was saving them, then they're never saved until they get die because they have to do everything that Christ said. And that's not true. We read over and over in the, in the scriptures that said the blood of Jesus Christ, 
shed. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. So the water is my step of, 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 of um, not just obedience, but I'm publicly saying, I understand who saved me and how, okay? So the Great Commission is make sure everybody understands how they got saved. Don't just pray a prayer. Don't just go to church. Baptism is something that is important for the, for the believer to say, I understand. It's not just something you do. It's something I understand and that I now declare. Because when you do it, that's your first step of coming out. Okay? It's not what makes you saved. It makes it, I know I am saved. Okay? Does that answer? Go ahead. Hmm? It wasn't. If you are in charge of the treasury of the queen of a country, he was in chariots. He was part of a entourage of people that were coming back. He had gone and worshipped. So when he gets out of that, I'm going to say there's maybe 20 other people there. Even if there's not, I say public, they, weren't, they didn't have church. They were, there was no church there. I understand that. But it's out in the open. Okay? Some people, it's in response to the fact that some people want to, I, I don't want anybody to see me. No, no, no. Just get baptized. Okay? And it should be public because it's kind of like getting married. People can elope. But it ought to be honorable. Weddings ought to be honorable. And you, you shouldn't be running from the bride's father. <laughs> it should be, let's have a wedding, okay? Now you can, yeah, go off, sneak off and elope. Ah, but that's not honorable. And baptism publicly is honorable. The world sees Christians coming out and saying, we're following somebody who died and was buried and rose again. That's why it's public. Well, that's a different, baptism is not your life. It's you saying who saved you. And if you, without baptism, you're in disobedience. Okay? And your, your, your spiritual growth is stunted. Your spiritual growth is hindered because maybe you're afraid or whatever. Well, no, no, do it. Go soul winning because it's right. Read your Bible because it's right. Join a church because it's right. Get baptized because it's right. But all of those things are next. Christ saves, then we get baptized to tell the world, I am saved, okay? Real quick, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, Nita? That's a sign. If they're not going to get baptized, that's a sign. Uh, do you understand? You, got, you belong to Jesus now. So there are all kinds of tests to find out did they really believe. But it's by grace through faith, not through water. Paul. I'm sorry, Tony, uh, Eric, I didn't see you. Well, they hadn't met him. He just kept saying, one is coming, one is coming. That's all he kept saying, remember? Baptized by Jesus. This was not saving baptism. This was a repentance baptism that got them ready to believe. Two, two, two halves. Repent towards God and believe toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And without Christ, you can repent all day and still go to hell. Without, so, so John's baptism never removes sin. Okay? Mm. Okay, I know I, I'm going to be finished here. Eric, you had your hand up? 
I thought your hand was waving. All right. Okay. Uh, we'll have uh, just a little bit more next week. We'll get on into the the uh, the life of uh, of Christ as we go further in Mark. Uh, don't think that that. Uh, you know, well, it should be easy. Well, some things are meant to be chewed on and learned, and it's a good thing because you need to look at it and say, how seriously do I take the Christian life? And how seriously do I understand what Christ did to save me? All you have to do is cry out. The thief on the cross asked Jesus, remember me, get me into your kingdom. He said, you're in. The, the, um, every example in the Bible um, uh, has um, uh, the, the publican, beating on his breast, crying out to God, saying, have mercy on me, a sinner. Uh, Romans chapter 9 says, the word is nigh unto thee, even in your mouth, the word of God, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, believe in your heart that God hath raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. No baptism in there at all. I don't mean the baptism has no place. But boy, if salvation, if Paul is so particular about the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he says, don't let anybody mess with that because once you add anything to it, you've made the cross of no effect and you are doing your own work and you're damned.